Thanks. Oh. Yes, well, um, it's a great honor and uh, frankly a great surprise. Um, so I'm going to tell you what, I've got, I'm, you know, I'm much better at writing than public speaking. So I'm going to make my excuses up front and then I'm going to tell you what, what I've written down here. Um, so I don't know, was it December or something? Nick calls me up and I forget, he wanted to help welding the mailbox to the front of his John Deere B. <laughs> and, and he says, and now I'm going to put on my Moses hat and it's my pleasure to tell you that we've selected you as Farmer of the Year. I was like, um, he says, yeah, you know, there's, you, you get free entrance to the conference, there's a stipend, there's a, you get to stay at the Radisson, you don't ever go outside when it's cold. Um, <laughs> and you got to do a few things, you know, you got to be there for the Thursday night opening, and, and then there's this little presentation, and then we might want a field day, and <clears throat> it's like, oh, you know, okay, fine. So I get here, I look in the program, Farmer of the Year Keynote. <laughs> so, um, I've been editing furiously, and uh, so, and, and, and I guess part of that is, um, Nick said, you know, you can talk about anything you're really interested in, you're passionate about, and I thought, perfect, Norton Motorcycles. This is a, <laughs> what an opportunity. I've got a 70 to Commando, and I never get to talk to anybody about it, because nobody knows what it is. So, how many of you have motorcycles? All right. Ride fast, take chances. <laughs> Unfortunately, Mary said, you can't. You're not doing that. And in her own sweet way. And so I'm not. I'm going to talk about locally adapted seeds, which is one of those things that um, I've just, you know, really got involved with. And, I'm, and I think it's really important and um, is a bit of the future. So if you, um, let's see, we should have slides showing up here. Um, oh, that's right. You told me there was a. There we go. Um, let's see, which way do we go? This forward? Yeah. I'm going to back up just a sec. Okay. So here we are. Um, and this, uh, one of the things about finding out in December that you can do a presentation in February is there are no, no chance to take pictures to illustrate the presentation. <laughs> So what you're going to see is kind of a year-long tour of our farm. And I'm hoping that the, you'll be hypnotized by the images and the, the things that I'm saying will just kind of filter in and, you know, in that stream of consciousness way and you'll, you'll go home and start saving seeds. Um, okay, so I guess we have to start. Um, and this is mostly about vegetables, but I think it really applies to any... Um, seed-bearing plants, so it could be legumes, grasses, you name it. Um, the, then the, the first thing is, look, why bother? I mean, what, what, why is this important? Um, so, are your favorite varieties of kale, cauliflower, onions, peas, and zucchinis hard to find this year? Um, are, all those, are all those seeds, or all your seeds, coming from someplace else? Do you ever wonder why that is? Uh, farmers have been saving, or selecting and saving seeds since the, literally the dawn of agriculture. And we don't do that anymore. There used to be hundreds of, of regional, local seed companies and um, you know, dozens in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And now there are just three corporations that control more than half of the seeds and the seed business in the whole world, and none of them are located here. So, I had been resistant to saving seeds for years. Um, I was thinking that I don't want to wait until it's harvest time to find out that I've got a seed crop failure. You know, if two-thirds of your purchased delicata seeds don't emerge, you know you've got a problem right away. 
you, got, you might have time to do something about it. If your saved delicata seed matures into some sort of a, that weird zucchini uh, spaghetti squash cross that you've seen on your compost pile, <laughs> it's probably too late to do anything about it. And so I wasn't interested in it. But then several things happened to change my mind. And one of them was really quality, seed quality. Um, you know, I have had two-thirds of my purchased delicata seed fail to emerge. And it's a, it's a problem. Um, the seed might have germinated in some lab somewhere, um, you know, where they have them in the little nutrient-free solution and the perfect temperature and humidity. And, but they weren't vigorous enough to emerge from real dirt. Um, and I don't want my money back for that seed. I want a truckload of delicata. I didn't buy them, you know, so I could get my money back. Um, and as it turns out, I'm three weeks behind. One week, you know, you plant them and you wait for them to come up. And then the next week, it's like, oh, and they don't come up. And then a, a week to get new seed. And I, I don't know, I know you're from all over. I saw there was a, a car with an Alabama license plate in the parking lot. Um, but I, don't, I can't give up a sixth of my growing season on a 100-day tender crop. It just doesn't work. I don't have time to do that. Um, and actually, I'm too disorganized to get, get past that. Um, so in general, I've found that seed quality has been decreasing in the last 20 years. Uh, another reason is availability. Uh, good varieties disappear. And when a hybrid goes, it's just plain gone. Uh, I, I had trialed red slicing tomatoes when we got started. Um, you'd try them for three or four years. You know, the first year, they, they might have just been crummy conditions or bad luck. So, you know, do an evaluation of a dozen varieties. Um, and came up with two good ones that worked for me, uh, Paragon and Primetime. And I, I don't know if you're growing them or don't care about them. But they were great. You know, solid tomatoes, tasted good, productive. It just worked in our system. Um, they were the best. So one year, there's only 25 seed packets of prime time available. I was like, well, that's odd, but okay. The next year, there weren't any. So and, you know, I was like, now what? Um, and, I, and I knew what had happened, that it was more profitable to sell me some other seed, um, some other hybrid seed. And I would spend, you know, three or four years trialing another six or seven varieties and come up with a couple that would probably disappear in a few years. So I, like, eh, I'm not going to do that. Um, I started trialing open pollinated tomatoes. Um, and they've worked out quite well. Um, the, the third reason is disease and disease resistance. When I was trialing those tomatoes, I found that a lot of the promising open pollinated tomato varieties blighted out. You know, it looked like somebody had gone through our tomato patch with a flame weeder. There were these little spindly heirloom stems, and they had a tuft of leaves on the top. And that was it. Um, you know, my experience has been that, that tomatoes without leaves just aren't productive. They don't work. <laughs> so, you know, and, and along the same line of thinking, um, seedborne disease is an issue that's becoming more and more popular, or popular, more and more prevalent. It's not popular. Um, <laughs> A lot of arugula seed has a bacterial spot disease. And if you're growing it under row cover or in a greenhouse, you may never see it. Or if you're growing it in a very dry climate, you'll probably never see it. But we don't, we don't do that. We have, um, we have trained all our flea beetles, so they just eat the very little bit of the first planting, and then they, I don't know where they go, but they leave. Um, so we grow them outside, and um, the disease expresses itself when the, the weather warms up and, it, and it's humid. And it starts as a little watery spot on the leaf, you know, the size of a pinhead, and then it gets big enough that it covers the whole leaf. And sometimes it has like a purple edge. And um, It's a new disease. Actually, I'm a published author. You'd be happy to know, I'm sure. Um, that I'd sent this to the, there's a disease lab, a USDA disease lab in uh, Salinas, California. And this was the first reported outbreak 
of this Pseudomonas, whatever it is, um, on arugula in Minnesota, and you can look it up. Carol Lee Bull is the lead author. So just you can, you can check. And you get your phone out still? You can check. Um, but anyway, this disease will, is spread by rain splash and wind. So the raindrop hits the leaf, it blows the bacteria off onto other leaves, and you can see it in, in the field. It, it grows like a fan out from the, the, in, the first infected plant. It infects everything in the mustard family, basically. Um, cabbages, broccoli, you know, mustard greens, the whole thing. Um, you know, these seed bags didn't come with a little warning label that said, these seeds are disease infested. They will not produce a saleable crop. Um, I'd, we went from selling 15,000 bunches of arugula. We did a lot of bunch of arugula. With 15,000 bunch, bunches of arugula a year to less than 2,000. And that was our early season crop. We were, you know, if you were eating arugula, full-size arugula in the Twin Cities, it was ours. It was absolutely nobody else. Had, you know, we owned that market. Um, but we couldn't harvest it. We could spend days picking through rotten leaves to get a little bit, and it just... It didn't work, so it's not really the results I were look, was looking for at the time. Um, and actually, the, uh, even I mean these are problems, but an even bigger issue is the global climate chaos that we see. Um, in in 20 years that we've been farming, um, we didn't have irrigation when we started. We'd water a little bit, you know, or wait till it rained and soil was moist, and we plant and never water, never didn't have to. And it, it got, got to the point where we would have 10 weeks where it didn't, wouldn't rain. And actually by the time it got to about four weeks, it's like, hmm, we, did, we, need, we need to water. Um, and, you know, and not to mention that it doesn't rain anymore. Um, when I was a kid, it would kind of cloud up in the summer and rain straight down for a day or two. And not so fast that the water would run off. It would all, you know, it was just real slow, gentle, a really nice rain. Um, we don't get that anymore. Now we get storms that dump two inches in a couple hours um, and winds that break off the tops of our trees. The last year we had three inches of rain every other week in June. And if you've been farming, you know that's really bad timing and a little more rain than we need. So just, and look, look back just a couple years, or just a few years. 2012 had a very warm March, and then there was that freeze that all the apple growers will remember for a long time. Um, we had, there was a hot July, a very dry summer. Spring of 2013 was wet and cool. There was a derecho, it's huge windstorm in, Ju in June. Um, July was very hot. 2014, you know, year before, we had four months of January. Um, <laughs> lots of snow. The soil temperature didn't get above 55 till the middle of June. Um, there, actually, there was so much rain last spring that there were a, over half a million acres that didn't get planted in Minnesota. And that's the corn and soybean guys. Um, they just they abandoned it. They abandoned their plantings. Um, and then last fall, we had a freeze on September 13th. So we had a late start and an early finish. Um, this year, winter started off with a bang. We had eight inches of snow, and then it got really cold. Um, and now we can see our lawn at home. I'm, you know, we can see the grass. Um, a lot of the fields is bare. Uh, if it was summer, we'd be in a serious drought. People would be watering their trees. Um, and in the meantime, we've had weeks-long stretches of record warm and record cold temperatures. It's just, you know, it's just not that that regular climate we, that I grew up with. That's what I learned to to grow in. So, anybody got any guesses what spring is going to look like or how this summer will be? <laughs> Please? You? Oh, now you know help, Mark. <laughs> this is just, that's, not, that's not helping. Um, so anyway, you could say this climate isn't very stable anymore. And a lot of the seeds that we grow are, are, are bred in very moderate climates. And they don't do very well here. Uh, the Olympic Peninsula is the world's best, way, world's best place to grow brassica seed. It gets down to 20, maybe, 25 in the winter. It gets as hot as 70 degrees in the summer. You know, they're surrounded 
with water on three sides. Um, broccoli plants that are bred in a place like that don't know what to do when the temperature hits 80 degrees one week and drops into the 40s the next. And that's not true. Actually, it does know what to do. It buttons and it goes to seed. Um, did you, any of you have trouble with broccoli last year? Your spring broccoli? Yeah. That's right. We did too. You can put your hand up. I don't um, so, um, you remember the motorcycle thing? I do have a bunch of bikes. Um, and farming inter interferes with riding them. So, so <laughs> every, every other year or so, I could take a trip and wander around the country. Um, and I had met a bunch of seed growers, and so I, I went and visited some people who were growing seeds on the Olympic Peninsula, out that way. And their, their climate's changing, too. Uh, they had record cold l last winter and record heat last summer. Their record heat was like 85 degrees, by the way, and their record cold was like 7 above. Um, remember all that missing kale seed? The cold was really hard on their overwintering brassicas. They plant in the fall, overwinter it in the field, and then it, it goes to seed in the spring. Um, the rainfall patterns are shifting too. That it used to be dry until October, and now it's starting to rain in September. Um, one of the growers I visited had $200,000 worth of beet seed matured in the field when it started to rain. They harvested about a quarter of it. Um, so back home, plants in our form are, you know, we're busy dealing with weeds. I know you're shocked, we're farmers of the year and all, but we have weeds on our farm. Um, I don't know. You, get, you know. you can probably, if you look close, I'm sure you'll see them. Some of that's cover crop, it's not all weeds on the side there. Um, but seeds that are grown in these cushy, clean conditions may not have the competitive nature. They get some out of the ground and ready to go root to root with weeds to get those nutrients that they need. Um, weeds are not an ideal condition, but that they're a fact of life. And seed, you know, seeds, I've said this, seeds grown in places where it doesn't rain um, don't express foliar diseases. You know, there's no, I mean, people that grew the arugula seed probably never saw this bacterial spot. Um, inputs, organic seeds grown in input substitution systems, and this is a, one that really grinds me, um, you know, where it's a, basically a conventional system, but they're using organic inputs. So they're flooded with nitrogen and water, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a conventional system with organic inputs. They don't do well in cover crop based systems because that first flush of nitrogen isn't there. So they sit around for three weeks trying to figure out what to do. Um, and again, that's a lot, you know, you're talking about a long, long time when your season's 120 days long. Um, so we really need seeds that do well in cold, dry, hot, wet, just all kinds of crummy conditions. That's what we need. So and I, I, access to productive, locally adapted seeds is important to me. And I suspect they'll be important to all of us in the next few years. And it'll, you know, it'll be too late to start adapting seeds once the need is really apparent. And you know, we're on the front lines. We'll see it first. Uh, it takes time to adapt those seeds. Uh, and uh, to adapt those seeds to all the varying conditions. And we have no idea really what they're going to be. But th we need that to be able to face the future that's probably coming. So how do you do it? Um, this is a, a, a little bit of an aside. You know, we don't, you know, we found this bird nest, so we flagged it. And so we wouldn't cultivate over it. We left them alone. They all hatched out and disappeared. Or they fledged and disappeared. That's a bacterial spot, by the way. Um, so Teresa Podal was here. She did a great presentation on seeds in the Farm Breeding Club. Um, Bill, 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 the sweet corn breeder from Wisconsin is here. Ruth Genger is here, the potato lady from Wisconsin. You know, there's all these people that really know what they're doing when they're breeding seeds and doing this stuff. Not me. So, so this, is, this is, and they're really serious about it. They're really good at it. Um, and what I want to say is, you got to be good at it, but you don't have to be serious about it. It's fun. Um, okay. so, so there are really three steps to seed production. 
adaption selection, and then saving them. You know, you're producing the seed. Um, the seeds themselves take care of the adaption part. Um, you know, most varieties have genes that they're not expressing. And I'm sure you've heard our, our pro-GMO friends saying that farmers have been doing gene genetic modification for centuries, right? I mean, you remember the Cal Gene Flavor Saver tomato? The one with the fish genes? Those guys were so clever, they were able to select tomatoes that had fish genes. It was amazing. But that's all nonsense, you know that. They should have selected for bacon and lettuce flavors. <laughs> so, so, should we talk about, no, let's not talk about genetics. Um, but plants do have an enormous ability to adapt to their surroundings. And they have to, since migration really isn't an option for them. If they couldn't adapt, they'd just die out, right? I mean, if this plant doesn't make it to seed, it's done. So it has to have a toolkit that it can pop open when the conditions are poor and produce seed. That's their, you know, that's what they do. That's what they're for. Um, you know, and we want to get in there and sometimes we stop them from doing that. We want to eat them. Um, so, besides, you know, besides adaption, there are a few lucky mutations, but they're pretty rare. And it's really up to us to select the adaptations that are most beneficial for us and hopefully for the plants. Um, so, selecting and saving the seeds, even for a year or two, makes a huge difference. Um, for example, we grew out Masato rose radish in the spring, and it goes to seed right away. It doesn't form a bulb, it just goes to seed. In the fall, we took that seed and planted it alongside of two rows of that same seed that we had purchased. When it come time to harvest, we only harvested the row that was the saved seed. The purchased seed leaves, the, the leaves on the radishes were all yellow, all full of spots. They looked terrible. They, you know. the, the saved seed leaves were bright green. It was like there was new growth. With the roots, the smallest roots in the saved seed were the same size as the biggest ones in the purchase seed. And, okay, if I haven't told you, I did tell you. I'm not a seed breeder. I'm, you know, actually, um, I, have a, I have a BS in physics. And that's, you know, and it's really great because I can make up stuff and you believe it. <laughs> but, but, and it's really well named, you know. But, but I'm not making this up. It's just, and I don't know why it was so what made that much difference that quickly? You know, we just planted them in, in our ground, took them and replanted them, and they were much better than the seed we bought. Um, another case, a few years ago, I was hunting around for the ideal cover crop seed, and I, what I wanted was a cover crop seed that we could eat. So I got some conventional winter wheat, it was a while ago, uh, planted it, got about that tall. Would have yielded all of about nine bushels per acre. And I, could just, I just knew that Norman Borlaug would be so proud of me. Um, so, not to be deterred, I took this stuff and planted it um, the, next, the next fall, got about that tall, and yielded 30 bushels to the acre in a no-input condition. This, we plant cover crops after our, our vegetables are done. So we had, um, so there was not really nothing left. I mean, we did two years of cover, cover crop, Two, two years of vegetables, we get, it's time to rebuild the soil, and that's what this stuff is for. But it did much better. It made a huge difference, just that one year. Um, but, but my real interest is in crops that make money, like tomatoes. Um, so, you know, kind of go back to the tomato trials. Um, I want tomato varieties that produce a lot of big, solid, good tasting, non-cracking tomatoes on disease resistant plants. So I started with a few of the, you know, kind of old line open pollinated varieties. Uh, Perone sprayless, a good disease resistant tomato. Martian giant, a big round tasty tomato. ORLST came out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's, a, there's a great story with it where the seed breeder died. His wife calls up another seed guy and says, hey, can you come and help me sort out these seeds? There's just like boxes of them. And this was a tomato that had no notes. And they planted it, and it was a good tomato. So um, we got some of those. Um, and just basically started by saving seed from plants that weren't all blighted out in the, in the fall. So, we, you know, it's September, and 
you know, there's a nice green plant. We'll take that one. And just, you know, and this is after a, a few years, I have some pretty productive tomato plants that look pretty good at the end of the season. Um, and of course my favorite characteristic is, is being competitive with weeds. And, you know, sometimes unintentionally, and, but more often than not, our seed garden is neglected and, and more than a little bit weedy. Um, but, you know, if a crop is not going to thrive in less than perfect conditions, it probably doesn't have a place on our farm. This is the way it is. So, um, and to that point, my latest disaster or selection experiment was with Emmer and Einkorn. I got excited. I went to the Northern Plains Sustainable Ag Society meeting year before and got excited about these ancient grains. So last spring, the miserable wet cold spring we had went on forever. No weeds would germinate when it's stale bed. Um, so I plant this wheat, it starts to come up and pff, it's a lawn of foxtail. So it was, you know, it was a beautiful lawn. Uh, some of the grain actually matured and ripened. Um, and I forced my crew to hand harvest it, head by head by head. Um, they were good sports about it, and we got a few pounds of seed. Um, those seeds are really valuable. They're competitors. They're going to do it. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the way it was supposed to happen, but it did. Um, but then, what are the chances that we're going to have less than perfect planting conditions in the future? I, you know, you know. Um, so this spring, actually, I'm going to go back where that grain was planted and see if there's any volunteers coming up. And if there are, I'm going to flag that and I'll be sure to get back there and harvest those, that grain, no matter how little it is. That is really, it's really valuable seed to me. Um, so um, in general, open pollinated varieties are a good place to start, but hybrids are a great, sace, great source of material. Um, they have some really outstanding characteristics but they need to be selected and stabilized. Um, and it can take years. But other times I'm not so sure they were really that hybrid in the first place. And if you're interested in saving seeds, you know, some of those really expensive peppers, um, save some of them. Because what I found is that with particularly peppers and eggplant, there's only about 15% that are off types. So, you know, and, and the ones that are off types, most of the peppers, or actually all of the peppers, are saleable. The eggplant, there are some weirdos, but, um, but you know, nobody eats eggplant anyway, right? <laughs> I love eggplant, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so, so, but it's like, hmm, that's a great, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so, I, you know, this is the third time I'm going to tell you this, so you better believe it. I have no background in, in plant breeding. Um, and I'm planned to trample, trample all over the correct nomenclature. But I'm going to define a couple of terms that'll make this a little bit easier to follow. So F1s are hybrids. Um, they're the result of crossing two inbred parental lines. F2s are the seeds that are saved from hybrids. F3 seeds are grown from F2 plants, and so on. And then at some point you give it a new name. So eggplants and, and peppers are pretty stable. Tomatoes are a lot wilder. Um, and tomatoes, I, I really like them. I, one of my favorite crops. I really like early girl tomato. It's an old hybrid, a 1962 All-American selection winner. Um, some of us remember when it was introduced. Uh, so they have, you know, it has the perfect balance of sweet and acidic flavors. It's an early tomato. They're great. So when we saved the seed from the early girl hybrid, the F2 plants were very non-uniform. Um, and some, some really interesting things happened. That uh, in the trays, when we seeded them in the greenhouse, almost exactly a third of the plants came up with a potato leaf rather than a regular tomato leaf. So obviously there was a, an heirloom in the background there somewhere. Um, and with genetics, you'd usually think you'd expect to either be 25% an off type or 50% because you know the the big T, little T. When you cross them, you get Little tea, little tea, big tea, big tea, big tea, little tea. So, um, see, I just made that up, and you believe me. <laughs> In any case, um, so we divided them up by leaf type, so we, now we've got two lines. Um, 
the, those plants had a variety of shape, sizes, disease resistance. Um, but one of the things we noticed is some of those plants were much earlier than the rest. And they start, that's, that's going to be the start, or that was the start of our F3 generation. Um, so they had the, those seeds produced the earliest tomatoes we had last year. They were earlier than anything, absolutely anything, cherry tomatoes, anything. Um, so I think that's really promising. They have a lot of it. They're adaptable to cold conditions. Um, the fruit was more un uniform, but there was still a fair amount of variation. Um, we let the plants sprawl right on the ground because we're going we're gonna to look for disease resistance. Um, some of the fruit was bigger, but there weren't a lot of them, so we mixed the potato leaf and the plain leaf, big fruited varieties, so we have a, a viable genetic base. Um, and this will be a third line of tomatoes. And, um, oh, and something, you know, with the seed saving stuff, you know, you've got to have miles between your, your seeds you're saving and all that stuff. <laughs> we do a lot of selections out of our production fields. Um, tomatoes cross a little bit. Peppers, hot peppers cross a lot, and they make some really interesting new varieties. Um, but I'm not stuck on preservation. You know, I make my money selling vegetables. And, you know, the Seed Savers does a great job. Seed Savers Exchange does a great job of preserving old varieties, and God bless them for it. Um, but I want seeds that are, that are better adapted to our conditions. Um, and really, you know, those, all those heirloom seeds that they got, somebody's grandmother, great-great-grandmother saved? She wasn't doing any isolation. She was picking them out of her tomato patch. So why don't we do that? So, actually, I do that. Um, so, so um, this is an awkward, really an awkward presentation because it's not a, a technical presentation where I can talk about these slides and, you know, have my PowerPoint up there and you can read the stuff as I read it to you. Um, <laughs> so, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little technical presentation, but it's, remember, remember, I have a BS. Um, so when you're saving tomato seeds, you should save them from 25 individual plants so you get a good genetic base. Um, that, that genetic base, the width of that base, uh, the number of plants you need to save s seeds from depends on the, on the type of plants. So in general, plants that self-pollinate, like lettuce and peas, you don't need very many. I think five or ten is a viable population. If you're doing an, um, an insect-pollinated plant like kale, you need more. If you're doing a wind-pollinated plant, you need a lot more, probably a couple hundred. Corn, you know, to have a viable population, you need at least 200. Um, but don't get hung up on that. You know, you're probably not growing the only lacinato kale on the planet. If it goes wrong, you can just buy some more and start over. Um, actually, come back to the seed savers for a second. We were there, and the guy talked about saving brassicas, biennials. And he, he'd pull up these cabbages and put them in a flower pot and put them down in his root cellar and water them like a plant, you know, like a flower. Um, it's cold and dark, so they really didn't grow. But they were still, they're still living plants, so they, did, they held in there. And when he wanted a cabbage, he'd go down and cut the head off of one of them and eat it and save the root in the pot um, and plant it out. And he, say, he was saving seed from eight cabbage plants. He'd be doing, been doing it for, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. I mean, a long, forever, you know, for a long time. And he said he didn't notice any decrease in quality. So that's a, um, you know, try it. Try it. Um, so anyway, so when we plant tomatoes for, in our seed garden, we're trying to stabilize these hybrids, we'll put 200 plants in a bed, and we can reject three quarters of them and still have plenty to pick from. Um, I got a warning about this a little later. But I'll figure it out. Um, so we can be really selective, and you know, a lot of the tomatoes that we rejected for seeds were fine for our CSA or our restaurant accounts. Just because they ripened a little bit later didn't mean they were bad tomatoes. And it's the same with peppers. There's a yellow bell pepper. Um, it produced some of these uh, yellow sweet pepper looking things. They were good peppers, they tasted great. We put them in with our, yellow, our mixed yellow peppers. They work. 
Um, one thing that does need attention is isolation. And you know, joking about it, it's, it's all fine, but every variety of kale will cross with cabbage or kale, except like red Russian, which is really a different species. It's closer to rutabagas than cabbages. Um, maybe not a great example, but maybe it is. Um, so unless you're breeding a new variety, you want to be careful about getting things crossing that you don't want crossed. I mean, you'd be really disappointed if your lacinato looked like a kohlrabi the next year. So don't do that. Um, so generally, plants that are in the same species will cross. So Brassica oleraceae contains broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kale, and kohlrabi. And they'll all cross. Um, Red Russian, as Brassica napus, won't cross with them. So you can plant them right side by side, let them flower, go to seed, they won't cross. Um, and isolation distance depend on whether the plants self-pollinate or are pollinated by insects. Self-pollinated plants, um, 50 feet might be great plenty, keep the pure seed. Um, squash are, are pollinated by insects, bees fly around a lot. Um, so they have to be, definitely have to be farther apart, and they might have to be a quarter of a mile apart to keep them pure. But if you're in a, you know, farming in a sea of corn and soybeans, you, you know, I mean, your, your conventional neighbors probably don't even have a garden, so you can plant, you know, plant one, and it'll be pure seed. Um, and really, if you're using the seed for your own use, it may not matter that a few of your Hubbards crossed with a buttercup. Um, my guess is that it would taste great still be a good squash. I know that Miami crossed with a Hubbard, which tastes good. Um, but, you know, if you're selling produce, you may, your customers might be put off by a 40-pound buttercup. <laughs> no. um, you know, mistakes do happen, um, and there are ways to fix them. Miami is an old uh, winter squash from the Miami people who live um, over Illinois, Indiana way. Uh, somewhere along the line, this seed got crossed with a Hubbard. And the original squash is about three feet long, six inches in diameter, kind of an orange color. Um, when they cross with a Hubbard, they get kind of a football shape. Or they could look like a little pink Hubbard. Um, and they all, every one of them tasted good. Um, so I received some of this crossed up seed and, and was asked to see if I could straighten it out. So there are a couple ways to do it. Um, one is we're going to look at, we're going to plant a block of this stuff. And we're going to look at the, at the female flowers, you know, have that, that little squash underneath. Well, we're going to go through and pull out everything that doesn't look like the real deal Miami. And then we're going to go through and we're going to pick off every female flower in the whole patch and every little squash, even if it looks perfect. And then we'll know, we'll, then we'll let them pollinate each other. But we'll know that, that that squash has a very good chance of being pollinated by the correct type of squash. Um, and as a backup, we're going to hand pollinate a few and see if we can produce a cleaner line. Um, so, messing with seeds is really fascinating stuff. Wait a second, I got to look and see where we are here. Um, I'm running out of talk here, so. Uh, but but uh, better than running too long, I guess. Um, this is some of our tomato seed saving stuff. Those are all buckets of containers of rotting tomatoes, which is how you get the seeds out of them. Um, hmm. I guess if I finish soon, I can, I can tell you what the pictures are about. Um, so anyway, messing with seeds is fascinating stuff. Um, but a word of warning. Selecting and saving seeds is kind of a vicious cycle. It's one of those things where it works and it's rewarding right away. You can see that what you've done is making progress. So the more you get into it, the more you get pulled into it, and the next thing you know, you've got these tubs of little packages of seed, and they're filling up the porch, and they're filling up the space by your desk, and they're everywhere. It's not quite as bad as cat hoarding, but it's kind of you know, in that same direction. So um, if you're finding yourself, oh, this is when you, when you save tomato seed, you, all the rotten tomatoes kind of break down and the, the sticky stuff on the outside of the seed um, softens up and you can wash it out and you, you, you pour it through it, you, you wash the seed time and time again and then you pour it through a screen and you wind up with a pile of tomato seeds. 
Um, if you save 25 eggplants, um, eggplants are really seedy. You get like three pounds of seed. Um, tomatoes aren't so bad, but it can be a quarter of a pound of seed. There's a lot of seed out there. Um, so anyway, if you're, really, if, you're, if you're interested in this, and you, and I, and you should be, um, <laughs> there's some really good books. Um, a couple that I've used are Seed to Seed by Susan, Susan Ashworth. Um, she gives, she's a very succinct about what, what, um, what the genus and species are of what will cross and what won't cross. Um, the Organic Seed Grower by John Navazio. John is a seed nerd. Um, he wrote this incredibly technical book for people who want to grow vegetable seeds. And he wrote it in a way that's really accessible. So it's a very good book. And then um, both of those are available at the bookstore. And another one that's available for free online is uh, Return to Resistance by Ra Raoul Robinson. It was written quite a while ago. Um, but it was this thing where we need seeds that have a broad genetic base rather than based on, say, one GMO gene or something like that, or they're all a clone so that when a disease happens, it wipes out all the corn in Iowa. Um, it's sort of less technical. Um, it's more inspirational. You can buy copies. There are, they're around. They're like 400 bucks. Um, and frankly, it's not worth buying. So just, re just read it online. Um, very good. So, you know, what's all this about? Uh, my vision is that we will form a local seed company that produces and distributes, distributes well-adapted, resilient, productive vegetable varieties. And I have no idea how this would work. I don't know if it would be a producer's co-op or a straight-ahead company. I don't know. Um, but I do know that it'll be a collaboration of many farms in this area because we do want to have more than one variety of cabbage, kale, onions. Um, so let's start now. Thank you. And Mary Reynolds, it's been a delight to have you here. You did a pretty Thank good you. job for someone who thought you were doing a short presentation. Yeah, I got to think Thursday night was it. Yeah, it was just great. <laughs> Thank you.